Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 173 of the podcast for May 2nd, 2013. My guest today is Alan Gleghorn. He's the CEO of Christie Clinic, which is located in central Illinois. And Alan is one of the keynote presenters at the upcoming Lean Healthcare Transformation Summit, which is being held June 5th and 6th in Orlando, Florida. And I hope to see you there as I will certainly be there. Alan's been the CEO of Christie Clinic for 14 years, leading their lean journey that started in 2005, thanks in part to his uh, seeing Theta Care now CEO, then Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Dean Gruner, presenting at a conference. So in this episode, Alan talks about how Chrissy Clinic got started with Lean, what they learned from the manufacturer AutoLeave and the Shingo Prize assessment process, as they were the first healthcare organization to, um, to go through that. And he also previews the summit keynote and how Christie Clinic's work with the new accountable care organizations is leading to better value and outcomes for patients. So for links and to all of the things we talk about in this episode, you can go to leanblog.org slash 173. And for all podcast episodes and to subscribe, you can go to leanpodcast.org. Well, Alan, thank you so much for being a guest here today on the podcast. Mark, it's great to be here. Thank you. Now, can you start off... Um, for the listeners, introduce yourself and Christy Clinic and tell everyone a little bit about your lean journey. Great, Mark. Well, uh, we've, uh, I've been the CEO here at Christy for a little over 14 years now, and we uh, are a multi-specialty group. We practice uh, a multi-specialty medical group. We pra- practice in East Central Illinois. We have about 16 clinical locations. Um, we're in... Uh, Champaign County and the contiguous counties here in East Central Illinois, and Christy has a, has a long history here. We're, we're uh, over 80 years. We've been an organization, and uh, but over the past 14 years, when I got here, we were very much in a turnaround type situation. The group was uh, in a lot of difficulty financially. They were in a difficult strategic position, and so in the early years here, we really were about uh, turning around, you know, and, and getting some financial stability and um, uh, getting ourselves in a better spot. But now, over the last seven or eight years, we've really uh, been in a much better spot, uh, performing very good financially. We've increased shareholder equity over 350 percent. We've increased our operating margin by 8 percent over the last few years. But what really, uh, after the kind of initial turnaround activities, which, you know, pretty straightforward what we did, you know, we had to, to, to downsize. We, we um, uh, you know, shut down some operations that were not performing well and, and uh, really kind of right-sized the organization. But then we, as we looked around, though, uh, we were performing very well financially, but we were uh, still not getting the phones answered uh, timely. We had appointment schedules backed up. And just from an operational perspective, we weren't where we wanted to be. And a couple of our docs went off to uh, uh, a quality conference and heard Dean Gruder from Betacare speak. And that was the first time that we had heard about lean. And, and that launched our lean journey in 05. And the thing about our lean journey, uh, I don't really ever do anything halfway, and so we really jumped in with both feet back uh, several years ago now and um, really worked at, you know, training our leaders, training all of our staff, and and uh, it was all about learning how to use the tools, and and uh, we, we uh, really kind of worked with the tools and, and uh, saw results as, as you do uh, with the tools, but there was a lot of... Uh, Un, uh, a lot of dissatisfaction with that and dissatisfaction from a leadership standpoint because we weren't spreading it fast enough in the organization, but dissatisfaction uh, too from a team member or an employee standpoint because it felt like a lot of top-down things being done to people as opposed to uh, being a help. We felt like we were hurting people, so to speak, just from a respect standpoint, et cetera. Mm-hmm. 
And so it was, it was about that time that we joined the Healthcare Value Network, and as a part of joining the Healthcare Value Network, I was able to um, uh, personally sign up to do some Shingo assessor training out in Ogden, Utah, and uh, went through assessor training, and, and I learned a lot through that. But really, more importantly, uh, as a part of that training, we got to take a deep dive into the auto lead facility there in Ogden, Utah, which is an airbag assembly plant and really got to see a very highly evolved lean culture. You know, they're the largest or the highest uh, scoring uh, winning Shingo Prize uh, uh, organization there. And, and uh, that really uh, caused me to have a wake-up call of, hey, there, there's a different way to get a culture of continuous improvement that is respectful of people, and they can also tie it to the customer because what I saw out there and heard was, Everybody in the organization talked about saving lives. We don't even do that in healthcare for the most part in a lot of situations. And so I was very excited then, and, and it caused us to really adjust the direction that we were going uh, with our journey and uh, really looked at a different approach, a more systematic way of getting our team members engaged and having leadership much more focused on creating an environment of that people could be excited about coming to work and have fun coming to work, but yet then align that excitement toward achieving the, the goals of the organization. So that's what we've really been focused on for a couple of years now. And boy, we've generated uh, in a two-year period over 10,000 ideas that we've implemented and uh, continue to see really good financial results. But the real exciting part is we have a, a really um, good level of uh, both team member engagement, but also we have a lot of physicians that are really embraced this and are working with us as well. So we're, we're very happy uh, with, with where we are. And so my talk will be centered around diving a little deeper into the different stages and, and really the lessons learned as we've gone through the different stages and hopefully would be helpful for people in the audience uh, in, in their journey. Yeah, so I, I want to come back and, and talk more about um, the, the Shingo model and that assessment process and talk about the summit. Uh, it, it's um, no surprise you mentioned auto leave. Um, I posted on, on my blog a couple of weeks ago, and I'll, I'll share a link in the show notes. Um, one of the leaders from auto leave giving a, a great talk at the AME conference here in San Antonio about their culture and aligning uh, everybody in the organization to their important mission and using lean uh, as a way of uh, improving safety and quality and of course um, their their business results um, and and so you talk about you know that culture and management system tell, tell us more about what you were describing as that transition from using lean tools maybe doing so in sort of a top-down way in that transition into more of a lean management system and a lean culture, how, how that happened and what that looks like today? Yeah, well, uh, I think that uh, as, as you're very much aware, Mark, in healthcare, uh, we, we, many of us, uh, including myself, got promoted because we were problem solvers and, and we were always uh, uh, walking around, I always say walking around as a solution, just looking for a problem. And so one of the things that um, we really, that resonated with the Shingo model with us was the fact that we could look at um, uh, systems and we could look at uh, results from those systems and behaviors we get from those systems. And the exciting thing for me on that was a lot of the tools and everything, we had Japanese words interspersed in there, but yet you know, systems and behaviors, that's something that resonates with healthcare people. And so I was very excited about seeing that in the model. But then um, the uh, part that we really have embraced, and it's just not me, it's our team members, uh, is that um, we really see the role of leaders in these systems as getting out of the way, frankly, mm. and having the people co-create the systems so that they have ownership in the system and when people have ownership in the system, as you know, they tend to embrace it. They tend to uh, play with the system as opposed to offer resistance to the system. And so it's that kind of key that, you know, for us, that was the secret sauce that really resonated here 
uh, in our organization because uh, you're also aware of healthcare, we're the, you know, on average, most highly trained workforce uh, there can be. And, and so to have that co creativity for the people actually doing the work. Right. was something that really resonated for us and, and got us excited about uh, this approach. And um, t tell us a little bit more about um, the, the Shingo assessment model. Um, some of the listeners, especially from the, the from healthcare backgrounds, might not be real familiar with the Shingo Prize or, or that organization or that assessment model. It has its roots in uh, manufacturing. Can, can you talk more about why you piloted that assessment process at Christie Clinic as the first healthcare organization to do that, um, what, what that assessment looks at and what some of the benefits were. Yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of folks in healthcare that will probably be listening to this are familiar with the, the Baldrige Award that's awarded uh, on quality that started in 89. And of course, the, ironically, the Shingle Prize started in 1989 as well uh, in honor of Dr. Uh, Shigeo uh, Shingo, who was an uh, honorary professor at the University of uh, uh, Utah State, but, uh, you know, originally worked with the uh, Toyota family and, and helped develop the Toyota production system. And, and the prize uh, was something started there and housed at Utah State University. And they wanted to award the prize where Malcolm Baldrige awards around quality. The Shingo prize is built around um, recognizing um, uh, the development of a culture based on continuous improvement and really the principles within the uh, uh, Toyota production system that people are familiar with that. And um, so that is, uh, but then the assessment process is basically a, a framework, if you will, of uh, uh, a, an approach that is a way to assess where one is on the journey. And the way the healthcare value network has used it isn't that we're expecting everybody to set for the prize. Uh, it's being used as just a tool, if you will, of assessing where an organization is on the journey, mm -hmm. but also more importantly is giving that organization really good feedback on what the assessors see that the organization could be working on and could improve on. So it's an awesome way to not just see where you are as a point on the line, but you, you receive a wealth of information in the form of feedback, and that's what Christie received and really caused us to reassess who we were on our journey based on the feedback from that initial assessment. And what were some of the key, what were some of the key things that you learned from that assessment process that um, were, were some immediate takeaways or things that you're even working on now in the long term? Well, um, I think uh, one of the key takeaways, uh, Mark, and this was really profound for us, uh, was in the area of rewards and recognition. Um, we got feedback uh, to uh, basically uh, the highest thing we scored on was a, a pumpkin contest. And uh, I think one always pauses and go, what do you mean by that? Right. Well, when the assessors were here, it happened to be before Halloween, and we have this departmental pumpkin decorating contest. And when the employees, uh, the assessors would go into an area, they go, oh, I know you're here to assess, but we want to show you our pumpkin. Uh, because these people created these beautiful pumpkins using creativity and all of that. And we got that feedback from the assessors, and I, I told my CI director, Jason, I said, boy, if we could just align this excitement and creativity around improving the work rather than just our uh, pumpkin uh, contest, uh, wouldn't that be something? Mm. And so uh, that, that was a key piece of feedback. But in the rewards and recognition area, I was a little frustrated when I got the feedback saying, other than the pumpkin, y'all don't really have something. And well, I know we have a bunch of reward and recognition systems, so I sat down my HR team and and had them, okay, I'm going to get on the whiteboard and write down all these reward and recognition systems we had, and, and we did, and I probably, we probably had a dozen or more. Yeah. But we really started looking at those, and they were really centered around things other than improvement, other than what we were trying to accomplish as an organization. So just example being tenure, those kinds of 
things uh, were interwoven in there. So that's just a, an example of one component of the model that really we got a lot of great feedback on was the reward and recognition system. Yeah. Well, and then, so I'm, I'm curious also to hear a little more before we talk about the Lean Healthcare Transformation Summit and your, and your keynote speech. You, you mentioned earlier that you, um, that you had 10,000 improvement ideas in, in the organization. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about um, so you know, this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, how, how you got the organization to the point where that many people were participating in that many improvements? If you can tell us a little bit about that. So uh, basically, as we uh, focused on implementing the system, we have a simple process of capturing the idea, and and basically, the idea is centered around making the right work easy to do. And so, uh, you know, these ideas aren't necessarily curing cancer, so to speak, but they're simple, straightforward ideas that can be experimented and implemented by the work group that comes up with the idea, as opposed to something that ha has to be approved and has some mm -hmm. chain of command uh, before it can be implemented. And, and so um, those 10,000 ideas, many of them are... Uh, were implemented and done by uh, the teams themselves. And, you know, I can give you lots of examples, but just like our laboratory team, um, they decided to focus on decreasing the number of redraws. And uh, so, you know, if you're a, you know, redraws might not sound important unless you're being the one that is getting blood drawn on you. Then a redraw is when we have to call you back because the uh, rat tube wasn't drawn or there was some issue with it. Mm -hmm. So for a patient, this is a big deal. And so literally this uh, team came up with, I don't know how many ideas related directly to redraw, just simple things, uh, i.e. Just, just capturing, okay, we had to have a re redraw, capture the reason why we had to have a redraw. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so they then were able to say, hey, that's the new person had more redraws, so they were able to set up some retraining for the new person. And, and they all did that within their work group without even having leadership involved. And we saw the uh, amount of redraws drop by 50% uh, over just a, a short time frame. And so um, that, that was the way we approached it. Well, great. And then let, let's talk... Um a little bit about the upcoming Lean Healthcare Transformation Summit, uh, which is being held in Orlando, um, June 5th and 6th. And I'll, I'll have links in the show notes for, for people who want to um, learn more and, and sign up. Alan, you're, you're one of the keynote speakers. Um, can, can you tell us about what some of the main themes are going to be in your keynote address? Well, I think the, the reason I've been asked to speak is because people are aware of kind of us going through these different phases and having been on the journey for quite some time. And we've been blessed in that, um, and myself have been blessed to be a part of the whole journey. And so one of the things that uh, will be in my presentation is just those key learning points as we've gone through each phase of the journey so that uh, the, the people that attend can hopefully have some takeaways. Hey, I, we've experienced that. That was the uh, adjustment because it won't be just when well, we went through this phase. It's what we learned from that phase and how uh, we addressed that or changed our direction based on what happened. So I think it's uh, one of these of uh, uh, somebody that isn't just a lean travel traveler having done the journey quite some time ago. Um, I'm going to be speaking from the standpoint we're still on the journey. I'm still uh, uh, in this with Christy. And uh, this is what we've learned about it um, uh, along the way. So it's more kind of a, a reality-based presentation uh, rather than a uh, theory or, uh, you know, somebody has read a lot of books and so they can give a presentation. Talking about that journey um, and, and, and the things that you're still working on, what, what, are some of the main, what are some of the main priorities for yourself and for Christie Clinic this year and, and, and looking at what's next? For your lean journey? Well, I think that as we've uh, deployed this uh, system throughout the whole organization and, and we're starting to generate a lot of these ideas at the work level, 
as we mature both from a leader standpoint and team member standpoint, we, it's really more about um, we, we're working on our visual management as an example of uh, taking that to the next level of actually, okay, we decide what the uh, objectives are as the organization. You know, how do we link those better down to the individual work level? Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's more maturing uh, the version that we have now, if you will, or the, the phase that we're in now. It's more about maturing that and having to, I call it, kind of turn the flywheel of improvement faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's what it's about. And, of course, with healthcare changing as we change as well with accountable care uh, coming online and us uh, having a reimbursement model that, that will be shifting more toward getting paid for value, you know, it's kind of wrap now for our organization to use this system to be adaptable to a new environment that's being brought to us, you know, via the Accountable Care Act and, and many of these external things that uh, will be impacting healthcare. And, and can you can you explain a little more? I mean, for those who might not be familiar of what an accountable care organization is, how that is is being driven by the Affordable Care Act, and 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 what some of these payment reform uh, measures are, and, and how that you know, talk more about how that's uh, affecting you or how you're reacting to that. Yeah, one of the kind of concepts that is interwoven through all of the Accountable Care Act and also accountable care organizations, one of the things that uh, is being brought to the forefront is uh, that uh, providers, healthcare providers should be paid for really the continuum of care that uh, they care for a patient. So multi-specialty groups like ours that care from pediatric patients to geriatric patients and everything in between. Um, we are being offered incentives now from Medicare and private payers to um, take uh, better care of those patients. So we're no longer paid just on how many procedures or office visits we do on those patients, but really uh, ha do those patients have all their key medical indicators in check? So if it's a diabetic patient, uh, do we have a um, accurate uh, blood test on them? Do we have an up-to-date blood test on them? Um, you know, if, if uh, a patient is called for a screening mammography, have they had the screening mammography? We're held accountable for that, and to the extent that we do that well, then we're paid either a bonus or uh, uh, our pay is based on a different methodology than just doing the mammogram itself. And, I mean, how, how, looking across the country, um, how, how, how widespread is the adoption of this ACO model and, and some of this different payment reform? Is it becoming more widespread? Is it, um, are it you know, how, how common is this? Well, I think in certain markets, it's, it's more common than others. And so certainly in some of the urban markets and all that, it's, it's more prevalent. But um, what's really driving it, I guess, nationally and, and is going to be driving it into all markets is because Medicare is getting very focused on it. And so one of the things going on with healthcare right now is these accountable care organization um, designations by Medicare. And, and uh, I don't know what the total count is now, but several hundred of these organizations now nationally are designated. Christie Clinic happens to be uh, in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and so we're one of those that are kind of uh, leading the way in this area mm -hmm. uh, of experimenting, if you will, because it is kind of an experiment that Medicare is doing on paying providers differently than they have in the past. And so it, it is an experimental phase, I'll, I'll call it, but it's a very widespread experiment. And I think the early reviews are that um, the, the uh, healthcare populations are um, uh, seen as healthier uh, when a provider group really gets focused on the complete continuum of care of the patient and not just how many of these procedures or office visits can we do on a patient. Well, and I tell you, I think from a patient perspective, that's encouraging to hear that this is not just a matter of uh, a 
affordable care, reducing costs, but also a matter of um, improving care and outcomes for patients. So can you give us an example of, of how that approach to, to care and reimbursement and that different type of system um, benefits patients? Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, point, Mark. One of the reasons I'm excited about accountable care organizations is for that very fact. You know, it's not a payment mechanism issue. Uh, it's really more about the patient. And, you know, an example might be that um, a quality indicator before on a, on a total hip replacement might be, well, did you have a, an infection or did you have to go back in and have a revision done on the hip, meaning a correction from the previous surgery? Uh, but now we're, we're not only concerned about those things, that's a given, we're more concerned, are you having ongoing pain? You know, can you walk up a flight of stairs pain-free? And, and all of a sudden, the focus of the practice becomes one of uh, what you want as a patient to be focused on, which is your, your outcome, not just from a quality standpoint when you have the procedure, but an outcome based on did it improve your quality of life? And we don't want to consider it a success unless it really improved your quality of life. And um, in, in another example might be that uh, you're up for some screening tests. And um, what used to happen is when well, we told you on your last visit, Mark, to come in and, in three years for um, that uh, top screening test. Well, now what we're going to do is we might tell you that when you're visiting, but also we're going to be reaching out to you uh, before the three years is up, say, Mark, uh, just as a reminder, we need you to get in to have this screening. So it's just that tighter connection. To me, it's, it's exciting because it kind of fits into our lean terminology in world too is, you know, we're going to have tighter connections with our patients. And uh, if you think about accountable care, it basically is eliminating that uh, space we've had between the patient and provider organization and creating a tighter connection uh, and holding the provider accountable to help facilitate that tighter connection. Well, well, well thanks, Alan, uh, for describing some of the, the innovative things that are happening in addition to or as a, you know, I think arguably as a part of um, your, your lean journey. I'll you know, personally very much look forward to seeing you again at the summit in Orlando. I, ho I hope other listeners will uh, come and hear more and meet you and uh, be part of the networking. Is there anything else you would say, you know, having attended these, um, any, any other thoughts you would add um, about the summit, what people can get out of that event? Well, I think it's, um, as I say in some of my presentations, uh, my advice my grandfather gave me, only take advice from farmers with fruit on their trees. <laughs> and I think what, what this conference does is it really pulls so many people together that are on this lean journey, and we can learn from each other. And, and the previous summits have been uh, awesome networking opportunities. We have several of our um, you know, executives there networking, uh, and it's just been an awesome event pulling people together that uh, even if you're dabbling in it, to, to come in and be exposed to people that have already jumped in with both feet and that we can learn from each other. Uh, and because even people with dabbling uh, in it, they can teach me something because whatever they're dabbling in, they've learned something from it. I want to learn that. So mm -hmm. it's just a uh, it's just a classic uh, way of uh, bringing people together that are, and, and as we know, healthcare really needs the meter moved, and I think the summit is helping do that. Well, I, I would agree, and I hope other listeners will be there, and come say hi to us. Tell us that, <laughs> that you've listened to uh, the podcast, and it would be great to hang out. So again, Ellen Gleghorn, CEO from Christie Clinic in, in Illinois, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for everything you do for the lean community and healthcare. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.